Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's my pleasure to introduce Li Qian Luo from University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. She's completing her PhD uh, at UIUC with Professor Tariq Abdel Jahir. And before moving to UIC, she was at University of Virginia working with Professor Tariq and Jack Stankovic. Her research interest is in programming models and tools for distributed network embedded computing, such as uh, sensor networks. And we will hear more about her research from her talk now. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's talk. Uh, today, I'm very happy to come to Microsoft and talk about my research. Uh, today, I'm, my talk will mainly cover a major piece of my PhD research, which is uh, Invarsuite, a programming framework to reduce the development cost in wireless sense networks. Before diving into the details of today's talk, let me introduce myself a little bit. My research interests are focused on wireless sense networks. I have worked on uh, multiple directions in wireless sense networks, including program paradigms, middleware services, and the integrated systems. Today's talk will mainly cover uh, a high-level program paradigm I proposed and a couple of middleware services I developed. And I will also show you results we collected from a couple of real, uh, real deployed systems. First, uh, what is wireless sense network? A sense network is a network of uh, sensing devices. Each of such devices may have a, a microcontroller uh, to do computation and a radio to allow them to talk with each other. And each of them may also have sensors and actuated to allow them to sense and react to the environment. Uh, this picture actually shows a, a representative of a sensor node, which is developed by uh, UC Berkeley. We call it a mode. So sensor networks have actually received lots of attention uh, in recent years because of their unique features. They are so small in size that they can be deployed anywhere. They can be seamlessly embedded into the environment and interact with the environment. And also, uh, they can be carried to anywhere as you want. And they can operate without the attention of administrators. Initially, sensor networks are introduced uh, to uh, the military applications like target checking and border control. Later on, people are applying sensor networks to a broader uh, category of applications, like uh, peop uh, environmental scientists are using them to monitor the nature and the creatures. And also, they can help with agriculture, and they can help to protect uh, important infrastructures like the Golden Bridge. Uh, nowadays and in the near future, we will see sensor networks being applied to an even a broader category of applications. They, like, they can be used to uh, respond to disasters like Kachina. They can be used to uh, control inventory in supermarkets like Walmart. And they can also be used to uh, control the traffic jams in big cities like Seattle. And they can also be used to help the baby boomers generation live more independently. And they can also make the uh, gaming more interactive, like uh, we too did with their uh, acceler accelerometers. And also, they can help to uh, guide the visitors to an occupied parking space wherever they go, like the uh, space monitor application developed here by Microsoft Research. So, but a fundamental challenge that uh, prevents sensor network technologies to be uh, widely adopted is the difficulties in sensor network application development. Why application development is so hard in sensor networks? Uh, there are a couple of reasons. First, uh, sensor network applications have has to be developed in an event-driven way rather than a flow-driven way, which is more straightforward because they have to handle the high bandwidth, uh, high, high, high frequency interrupt uh, from the I/O devices, including sensors and actuators. Also, our sensor networks, uh, the the programming of sensor network has to uh, like define the behavior of each individual node instead of define the overall behavior of the whole system, so that a programmer has to explicitly define which uh, what what each node should do and how they should interact with each other. And also, uh, sensor networks actually are running on embedded devices, which means they have very little runtime uh, visibility. Like the my cousin modes we are working with a lot, they only have three LEDs to print nav. That means during debugging, you only have three bits of information you can get. And also, uh, the inputs to sensor networks are actually uh, dynamically changing. It's the dynamically changing environment, so which make 
this will actually make the output of system unpredict unpredictable and also make uh, troubleshooting really, really difficult. Therefore, as a result, most of the current uh, sensing network programmers are actually PhD students with very intimate knowledge of sensing net network te techniques, and they have very excellent system skills. Uh, let me give you an example. In a uh, surveillance system I'm involved with, it actually took uh, 10 PhD students to work on for almost two years to develop, to develop uh, implement, and actually test the system. So that is not good. The goal of my research is try to uh, provide enough development support so that we can uh, lower the adoption adoption uh, barrier of sensing network techniques, make it available to uh, a much broader community. Then how, sh how can we reduce the development costs in sensing networks? I think the first thing we should do is we should provide the right, uh, right level ab of abstraction so that sensing network applications can be, can be uh, designed and implemented uh, by using only describing the overall behavior of the system instead of we have, instead of requiring the programmers to describe uh, what each node should do and how they should interact. Second, uh, we also should buy, provide enough uh, middleware services so that we can isolate the programmers from uh, various low-level details like uh, in distributed storage or in multi-hop communication. Also, uh, debugging in sensing networks are really hard because a uh, sensing network system may fail because of hundreds of possibilities like sensors may fail, actuators may fail, OS may fail because of not, not enough protection and the communication stack might be messed up. We should not, not just uh, leave the programmers like uh, cry before the thousands of possibilities. We should give them hand provide enough debugging facilities uh, to zoom them into the buggy, buggy places that actually cause the failures. Therefore, uh, I developed a programming framework called Inversely to try to uh, reduce development costs from all the three aspects I mentioned. The contributions of Inversely, including a high-level pro program abstraction called Environmentally Immersive Programming, uh, short as EIP, to raise the ab abstraction level from uh, individual nodes uh, to physical objects. Second, I also uh, identified and developed a lot of uh, middleware services that can isolate programmers from uh, low-level details in distributed storage and in multi-hop communication. And uh, finally, I also provide uh, some debugging tools uh, to facilitate those uh, in-field debugging and troubleshooting. All these services in Virasuite has been extensively tested using uh, deployed systems like VirtualNet, which is a surveillance system, and Environmic, which is a monitoring system uh, to record bird vocalization. This is the overall architecture of Invite Suite. Upon sensor network operating systems and hardware, we built our framework. It includes high-level abstractions as its user interface. And also, we provide a runtime support library that to, to, to be able to support the abstractions during runtime. Then I also developed a couple of middleware services, including a storage service and a, a, a transport layer protocol that uh, can help with the EIP abstractions. Then, by using our EIP abstractions, Programmers can develop their applications using our high-level abstractions. Then we provide a preprocessor which will take the input, uh, take the application code as input and integrate the algorithms from our uh, runtime library and the middleware services set and create runtime code that can be directly uploaded to real uh, sensor devices like uh, those MICA, MICA 2s, MICA Zs and XSM modes. Then these modes will be deployed into the field. Uh, during the in-field in -field experiments, uh, we also provide uh, debugging facilities that can help that can help with in-field debugging and troubleshooting. In today's talk, I will first uh, cover the abstractions and their support library. Next, I will talk about the storage system we developed, and also I will uh, talk about our debugging tools uh, very briefly. Uh, today, I'm not going to cover the uh, transport layer service we de developed, and uh, also I'm not going to talk about the preprocessor. Uh, let me start with the abstractions. So before I go into the details of our high-level abstractions, let me uh, give an overview of the existing program paradigms in the sensor networks. Initially, we have those uh, node-based languages like NASC, which uh, can actually allow programmers to define the behavior of each node to define how they interact with, with each other. Later on, people uh, propose a lot of high-level abstractions like the event-based uh, models actually uh, allow programmers to define events and define how the system responds to those events. Then the group-based models model sensor network as uh, sensor groups and allow 
programmers to operate at the group level, then the query-based models actually model sensor network as databases, and the virtual machines uh, actually allow users to freely upload and execute new code to the sensor network. However, one important opposition is that the unique feature of wireless sensor networks, which is its uh, di distributed and interaction with the physical environment, is not, not well captured in all the existing uh, paradigms. So, but why should we capture this interaction with the physical environment? Let's take a retrospection of the objections in, tra uh, in traditional distributed uh, systems. Uh, taking this distributed file system as, as an example, uh, in distributed file systems, instead of uh, giving the programmer the view of interconnected servers, they actually directly present the view of uh, directories and files that are more interested to the uh, users of the file systems. So similarly, in sensor networks, we should not provide uh, the programmers a view of like network of distributed nodes or a view of uh, node clusters. Instead, we should directly present the physical world to the programmers because that, that, that is what they are most interested in. We should uh, provide a logical view of the physical, physical world directly to the programmers. That's the main idea of our environmentally immersive programming. Basically, we try to uh, re revolve our abstraction directly upon the physical world. So uh, this is environmental immersive programming we proposed short as EIP. EIP basically try to map the physical entities in the field uh, into logical objects in, in, in the logical world. Basically, they allow programmers to operate on a virtual world of logical objects instead of the physical world of physical entities. So each of such logical objects will have object, name, object IDs, and they, the objects will only be instantiated when the cor corresponding uh, physical entities are detected in the field. And uh, as the physical entities move around in the field, our objects will follow them, migrating from one set of nodes to another set of nodes. And also, uh, programmers can encapsulate the aggregate state of the physical entity into the object. Then they can also freely define tasks for the object so that those tasks will be always be executed in the vicinity of the physical entity. Then uh, to be able to accomplish more complex goals, we also allow users, uh, we also allow objects to talk with each other by using a remote task invocation. Let me give you an example. Like here, assume programmers have defined like three type of objects like base station, person, and a vehicle. They basically need to define the sensor, sensory signature of each of such uh, objects and also define the aggregate state and also tasks. Uh, this base station don't have any sensory signatures because it's static. Then during system initialization, a base station object will be instantiated uh, during system initialization. Then later on, when a vehicle enters the field, it will be get detected, and we will automatically associate a vehicle object to the to the physical entity, and uh, this uh, f vehicle object can actually use remote task invocation to report its uh, current aggregate state, which is the estimated position of the vehicle back to the base station object using this uh, remote task invocation. No matter this object moves uh, in the physical world, our logical object will follow it and continuously reporting the. Uh, reporting its current location to the base station. And when another type of uh, physical entity enters the field, which is the person, we will also automatically instantiate a person object uh, to be associated with the, with the actual person. So how such uh, object-based uh, abstractions can be supported at runtime? Next, uh, I will talk about our runtime support library to actually implement these uh, abstractions. Uh, in our runtime library, we actually provide a different kind of object management algorithms for different type of physical entities. Like uh, for those entities that are uh, small in terms of sensory signature and that are moving really fast, we provide uh, checking objects. Uh, examples including like uh, ve moving vehicles or moving persons in the field. And then for those uh, physical entities uh, with large sensory signature and are not moving so frequently, uh, we provide region objects. So. Basically, uh, this is uh, with a huge uh, sensory signature, and they are not mo moving so frequently. Then, for those uh, physical entities that are willing to uh, present themselves to the system, we, provi we provide self-identified objects. Uh, examples of those uh, self-identified objects, including uh, like an uh, owner of a smart home who's willing to tell the sensor network system that he's actually uh, the, the owner of the system, his mic. 
are so for, for that kind of uh, physical entities, we provide self-identified objects. Uh, today's talk, I will uh, focus on this uh, checking objects because they are the most challenging ones because of first they are uh, mobile and also they are not collaborative. We are facing actually a lot of uh, challenges when uh, we trying to when we tried to support this uh, checking objects, including our like uh, context maintenance which means like how to instantiate, dynamically instantiate object and how to manage the aggregate state for the objects and also uh, including uh, interoperative communication which is uh, how to allow op dynamic objects to talk with dynamic objects. Uh, today I will uh, mainly focus on this uh, unique object rep representation problem uh, which is the problem of how to create only one object for each physical entity and how we can migrate the object as the physical entity moves in the field. Let me uh, tell you the details of the algorithm using an example. When the target enters the field, it will be detected by a group of nodes. They will actually form a group, and a leader will be elected among them. This leader will actually instantiate this object and assign a name to this object. And it will also send out heartbeats uh, to the neighboring nodes, which are the green, green ones, uh, to tell them the context of the object. Then uh, when the object moves to another location, it will be always be detected by the followers who already know about the object context. So instead of instantiate a new object, they will just join the current object. In this way, uh, we can actually maintain uh, one object for each entity. And uh, then this new set of nodes will detect the object. They will, currently, they will join the current object. And the old leader has to retire because it no longer sends the target then uh, a new leader will be elected and it will recruit more followers. And, but the old followers will eventually forget about the object after they time out and they will erase the context of the object to ensure enough uh, time granularity. Then uh, as we can see here, uh, this target is always wrapped by a set of follower nodes so that we, we're, we're never to move, it always get detected by the followers so that uh, we will not create spruce objects, we will just join the counter object. However, this algorithm is not perfect. Uh, there are cer certain conditions it has to met uh, to ensure unique representation. For example, uh, this target should not be sensed by a node outside the awareness horizon, I mean the follower set. In this case, uh, this target is detected by a non-follower node which doesn't know about the object. In, that, in this case, a spurious object will be created. So uh, based on that uh, condition, we can uh, actually derive the failure pos pos probabilities of, of this case. Uh, here, there's an there's a important uh, metric, which is maximum back of time t. Uh, this is used in lead handoff. Basically, our lead handoff algorithm works like this. Uh, the old leader will send out reti retire messages. Then the, the current members, when they receive the message, they will set a timer, which is randomly chosen between 0 to t. And, uh, the one whose timer expired first will actually become the new leader. So based on these uh, parameters, we derive the failure probabilities as below uh, without going into the details of the equations. Uh, the intuitive is that when the velocity is really high, we are experiencing more failures. This is actually uh, proved by uh, our simulation results. Uh, this is simulation results I got from a tossing simulator. Uh, basically, we deployed 40 nodes in a four by, uh, 10 by 4 grid. Then there's one target that goes through the field straightly along the longer line. Uh, ideally, we should only see one object because there's only one target in the field. This figure shows for different target velocities on the x-axis, the number of objects created on the y-axis uh, for different uh, percentage of message loss. We can see that actually our algorithm can tolerate up to 50% message loss when the target velocity is less than 4 grid per second. If we assume this unit grid length is 10 feet, then that 4 grid per second can be mapped to 80 mi 89 miles per hour, which is already very good. However, we do see some spurious objects created when the velocity is really high because of the failure conditions I've described uh, in the previous slide. There are also uh, other cases that our, our algorithm may fail. Uh, this is another case. Uh, basically, if we are not having enough nodes so that there will be no desert in the field, a node desert means a, an array that contains zero node. So if the node desert is so large that it's, it's bigger than the follower, than the uh, lead heartbeat uh, range, which is bigger than the follower set, 
That means we can never recruit this node n into follower set. In this case, when the target travel out of the desert, it will be detected by a non-follower, so, and the superior object will be created. Another uh, case for node desert is if the target is moving so slow that when it moves out of the field, the followers already forget about the object. In that case, uh, a spruce object will also be created. Uh, these two conditions can be mapped to uh, these two uh, equations, which tells us this size of desert has, cannot be too big so that we will uh, actually miss the, miss the target. Uh, based on that, we can derive the failure probabilities. Uh, here, we made this assumption that uh, the nodes are, are uniformly distributed in the field. So the number of nodes within a certain area can be modeled by a uh, binomial by distribution. And when the total number of, uh, total number of nodes are really huge, uh, this binomial distribution can actually uh, be approximated by a Poisson distribution. Uh, both based on those uh, assumptions, we can derive the failure, failure probabilities uh, as below. This equation actually tells us when the node density is high, here this uh, pi rs squared d means the number of nodes within the sensing range. If the number of nodes within the sensing range is bigger than 4.6, this uh, failure probability is always less than 1%. That's, that can be ignored. However, uh, when the node density is not so high, uh, actually the velocity of the target really affects our algorithm. It tells us if the velocity is really low, we will experience a higher failure probability when the node density is not so high. So this is the so, so in analysis, uh, you assume the Gaussian distribution in the uncertainty or uh, what's the exception of the probabilistic model? I assume uh, I assume our nodes are randomly distributed in the field and uh, so the number of nodes within an array can be modeled as a binomial distribution. And then this binomial distribution, when the total number of nodes is really high, can be approximated by a Poisson distribution. So based on Poisson distribution, we can say that uh, the, the probability that it contains zero node in an area is actually E lambda. So this lambda is the node, actually the node density. So this is the simulation results we got. Uh, notice that this is a different graph from the, from the previous one. Uh, here, we are comparing different number of node failures. When more, node, when more nodes failed, actually we are uh, seeing uh, less, uh, lower node density. So for this uh, simulation, we see that uh, when the velocity is really low, actually we cannot tolerate really high node, 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 node failures because uh, uh, when the node density is, is low, actually we cannot uh, uh, check target with very lo low speed because the follower set already forget about the target. Then uh, we can actually tolerate up to 50% node failures when the velocity is between 1 and 4. For both, uh, when the velocity is really low or velocity is really high, we do see spurious objects, which is consistent with the equations we derived. Now let's move on to a real test bed. Uh, here I will show some uh, experiment results we collected from a test bed of Mica Z mo uh, Mica 2 mo Mica 2 modes. Uh, we used 40 Mica 2 modes deployed in a 10 by 4 grid, and uh, we used both NASC and Inverse Suite to develop a checking uh, system. Uh, actually, these two versions are, are different. This NASC, for this NASC version, it is actually a node-based language. Uh, it requires programmer to define the behavior of each individual node. Uh, in this NASC version, uh, each node will only report their locations to the base station when it detects the target. However, in the inverse suite version, uh, this, uh, this, app, uh, this estimate uh, position of the target is actually maintained by our group management algorithm. The data aggregation is automatically done in the field, and only the final result is, is reported to the base station. Uh, as we can see that, uh, in terms of number modules, uh, NASC version used 12 modules, but our investment only requires three modules. Then in terms of code length, this NASC version actually requires 3,600 lines of code, but our investment version only needs 200 lines of code. This tells us actually investment can allow programmers to uh, write simple code for their applications. So you have this preprocessor which converts that into the high new S uh, lines of code. Have you come that lines of code versus the, uh, the native implementation you see whether they are on the same order of magnitude or not? Uh, actually, the compiled version of Immersuit is a bit of, uh, is actually larger than the 3600 because we have those uh, intelligent uh, uh, local aggregation going on. 
what, what's the rough size? The uh, I think it will be uh, a thousand or two thousand bigger. So that's not too much different, right? Like yes, because this uh, actually this uh, preprocessor will only select the re required uh, algorithms and integrate them, not the whole library. In the let's say the native version, you don't do any aggregation in the network. Each no. node sends a yes. response yes. whenever they detect an object. Yes. So to try to make this programming simple, we just did a, the, the simplest scenario, which is at, at every node just report their location back to base station. Then the base station will do some uh, offline analysis to try to get the current location. This code length is then just for the code on the node? Yes, just for the code on the node. To detect the object and report it back to the base station. Yes, including like a routing and uh, detection algorithms. Yeah. Our now I will show the performance of these two algorithms, uh, two implementation versions. The top graph shows the uh, trajectories of, of trajectories we got at the base station. We can see that uh, the trajectories are actually similar. Then the bottom graph shows the number of packets sent at each node. We can see the NASTY version actually send more packets when it's close to the base station. Uh, but the inverse read version actually has a very uh, balanced uh, number of messages sent out because it, it does a uh, uh, local aggregation to be able to uh, reduce the number of uh, packets. So this, this tells us that inverse... What's X again? I'm sorry, I missed it. The bottom one? Yeah, the, the X is. What's X? X and Y is, is uh, the, the ac just the axis. So each of the bar actually shows a node. So we have 40 nodes in the field. This shows for this node how many messages is sent out. The smaller x means closer to... Base station is actually located uh, in, the, in, in this corner. In this corner. Ah. Yes. Now let's move to uh, real systems that are deployed into the physical world. But that's because just the fact that, that you are not aggregating yes. the network, right? It's the yes. artifact of the particular implementation. Uh, yes, that's, that's correct, because uh, even Try, try to implement this simplified version of checking, we already use like uh, almost 4,000 lines of code. If we uh, try to uh, like add local aggregation into the, into the algorithm, we'll, we'll make the length of the algorithm even lo longer and uh, even more uh, error prone. Now let's move to the uh, real experiments. So this uh, EIP runtime support is actually integrated to to a real uh, surveillance system called VigilNet. Uh, VigilNet is a surveillance system that is used to detect, classify, and check uh, different targets in the field. It, 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 it can actually uh, check four, four different types of targets, like uh, a person, or a person with a metal object in his hand, or a small vehicle, or a, a big truck. So VigilNet is actually one of the largest efforts in the Sentinel community to try to build a real surveillance systems. Uh, this results I will present is actually collected uh, using 200 XSM modes shown on the figure. And the, the results are actually uh, collected by a third party. Uh, I have a question on the previous Okay. One. So 40,000 lines of code, that's the one uh, about the, the libraries uh, so the including the uh, middleware service on the routing and uh, yes yes so including the, the layers that you build yes okay. and the protocols you talk about is the networking protocol it's uh, about a lot of protocols like power management uh, time synchronization and everything I will show you on the next slide the, the system architecture so basically this is uh, built upon Visualize is built upon XSM two modes and uh, we developed like a communication layer and a sensing layer above that we have a lot of middleware service developed too then about middleware service we, we have this application layer which actually get the current location of the target and uh, the current velocity of the target then report to a remote command and control center uh, which is uh, far away from the real deployment and this remote control center will actually turn on more sophisticated sensors to do a further classification of the target or turn on a, turn on a camera to take a picture of the target. So uh, these three modules, including checking, data aggregation, and group management, actually adapted from the EIP runtime support. So this VigilNet is actually a collaborative project. I'm responsible for about one-fourth of the code. Um. The X scale uh, that, that, that is this the uh, the uh, 
PXA based model is that it's the it's the the small model, the Talas scale model. This has a much much larger process, is it? Uh, it has a larger form factor because it 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 actually integrate both the sensor board and the program uh, the the CPU board together into one board, and it has better security. It is pre pretty similar with Mica Z modes, but it has like a PR sensors, which is infrared sensor to detect motion. What so, what's the uh, you mean operating system? The, the processor. Is this oh, the, uh, it's the same as Mica Z. The MSP yes. And then this is running Tiny OS. Yeah, this is running Tiny OS, but we have uh, different uh, drivers because the hardware is different. So you are building on top of Tiny OS, yes. utilizing Tiny OS drivers, or you actually bypass that using your own set of drivers? Uh, the hardware drivers actually is developed by Ohio State, together with the with the hardware, and uh, we we so those. Those are both bot and sensor drivers, and uh, and the radio drivers are are either provided by OSU or provided by by Berkeley. Then we are building above that, build build the communication layer, including robust uh, robust uh, division trees and asymmetric detection algorithms. This is the uh, evaluation scenario we did with the 200 XSM modes. Basically, we deployed our 200 XSM modes on the T T intersection of the road. Then our uh, the result of the field will be reported to a remote control and command center operated by a special operation command. Actually, we never entered the control and command center. They are collecting results in the com command and control center. Then uh, this mode field actually will also, this con command control center will actually turn on more sophisticated sensors uh, de de developed uh, far away from the mode field. It's like here to uh, turn on those more sophisticated sophisticated sensors to do further classification and or take pictures. Uh, actually, we do not have access to those sensors, so we don't know what, what are those sensors. Uh, this is the actual deployment. We deployed our 200 XSM2 modes on the side of the road. Then this is the result collected by uh, those uh, special operation command. Uh, this result actually tells us the average tracking error is about 6 meters. Then the velocity calculation error is about 6%, which is very accurate. This result also tells us that, indirectly tells us that uh, our EIP runtime, runtime support can actually check uh, very fast uh, moving targets in the real uh, deployment. So basically, in this part I've covered. Can I, can I OK. So for this deployment, what's the? Can you show the actual deployment on the road? Yes, here. What's the actual geometry? In other words, what's the average uh, internal distance? Oh, it's 300 meters by 200 meters. Basically, the nodes are about 5 meters apart. Not 5 meters. Yes. This is a 200 meter by uh, 300 meter by 200 meter field here. Right. Yes, because uh, this XSM2 mode actually has better uh, performance in terms of uh, communication range compared with Mica Z's. So that allows us to deploy them further. Actually, in the e previous experiments we did with Mica Z's, uh, no, it's Mica 2's, uh, we can only deploy the modes about three feet apart because they, they have really bad communication range when they are deployed in, on the grassy ground. And the sensing is the PIR? Sensing, we use three types of sensors, uh, PIR, acoustic, and the magnetic, to be able to like classify different targets. OK. So for person detection, we use the PIR. Just PIR? Yes. And what's the range in this case of PIR? Uh, the PIR, actually, it, it, its range is really good. It can go about uh, uh, between 5 to 10 meters. It's better than the magnetic sensors. So we actually we had a diff, uh, had a very difficult time with a person with metal metal objects because so those metal are not huge, and uh, they have to work close to the mode to to be able to be picked up by the magnetic sensors. Mm -hmm. But you can tell a person from vehicle. Yes, we can also tell person from from soldier like with weapons. So in the first part, I covered uh, the high-level program paradigm I proposed and also showed its promise in a real deployed system. Uh, next, I will talk about a storage service we developed at uh, UIUC. Uh, so why we need a storage service? This is to allow the objects to deposit their 
their states in the network. So why we need that? Uh, so far, we have assumed a connected operation model. Basically, all the objects, they can directly talk to a base station. The whole central network is connected with the base station so that the, the, run, the uh, real-time state of the object can be reported back to the base station uh, in real time. Uh, this gives us the benefit of real-time information access. Uh, this benefit actually is very critical in uh, military type of applications that, like those surveillance systems. But uh, do we really need real-time information access in all the applications? Let me give you an example. Uh, recently, we met an ecologist from uh, National Resources and uh, Environmental Science Department. Uh, his name is Michael. Michael is actually studying birds. Uh, he's really interested in uh, explaining two unknown phenomena of, about a bird. Like one is those birds that are mostly active at the daytime. They they like to sing actually at night, and also uh, those birds they like to sing at their loudest uh, sound and and in the uh, highest frequency during the first light of the day. So uh, what he planned to do is he wanted to record the vocalization of the birds and try to uh, deploy the system for long term so that he can, he can find out whether this is associated with like uh, mating behaviors or something else. So after he heard about uh, sensor networks, he's really interested in using sensor networks to collect bird vocalizations. Uh, what he plan to do is just like to deploy sense network into the field, then let them stay there and collect data for several days or several months. Then after the whole experiment is done, he can get the, get the sensor back and also the data back. Then he can do offline analysis to, to find out what's the reasons for those two phenomena. Uh, in such kind of application scenario, actually we do not need a real-time information access. Actually a lot of other applications fall into the same category as this application, like the Great Dark Island application, and also those uh, uh, wearable sensor networks that try to uh, check the activity of a person. So uh, we think we no longer need the real-time information access benefit of uh, in such kind of applications. What we should do is we should just go to disconnect it without a disconnection to the base station. This actually even gives us more benefits, like we now don't need to worry about base stations, don't need to worry about how we can power up the base stations in the wilderness, and how to protect them from animals and the severe weather like, like the rain in, uh, at, at Redmond and the, the winter snow in uh, our Champagne. Also, we don't need to worry about maintaining 100% connectivity. This is actually really hard when there are a lot of mod mobilities in the, net in, in, in the network. So, but what we need is a storage system that can actually uh, use the in-network storage, can maximize the in-network storage to reduce data loss. That's why I developed a storage system called EnviroStore. This EnviroStore actually can allow those objects to deposit their observations of the uh, physical entities in the network. And it, will, it can actually isolate the concerns in distributed storage management when the network is actually operating disconnectedly. It, it mainly uses uh, two mechanisms to maximize in-network storage. One is using a data redistribution between uh, the individual nodes. The other is try to always take the best advantage of uploading opportunities. Like the operators may visit the field uh, sporadically, uh, bring them, uh, take, taking with them uh, a PDAs. Then our storage system can actually automatically detect the uh, data mules and try to upload data as soon as possible to relieve the uh, storage uh, load in the network. Using this storage system, actually, we are able to uh, develop an acoustic monitoring application called EnviroMic. EnviroMic can actually detect and record uh, interesting sound in the field. Uh, when the acoustic events are detected, uh, we will invoke this uh, group management algorithms, which is uh, part of the EIP runtime support, uh, to dynamically uh, designate one node in the vicinity of the target assign it the task of recording, then this node will turn on its microphone to record the sound of the object, attach a timestamp to the recorded data, and store it into the local flash of the node. Then uh, the part of how to balance the data between different nodes and how the data can be uploaded to a base station at a later time is automatically handled by Store. Then this group management algorithm is actually adapted from the EIP runtime I've uh, introduced uh, in the previous slides. So, so are you saying that, uh, that uh, there's only one uh, sensor node that got elected to record the acoustic waveform? Yes. Whereas the others are suppressed? 
Yes. From the topic. But, uh, but um, so you, you assume that uh, if there are two birds that actually are singing, but you only need very close by, and you only need one sensor to detect them. Ah right? uh, yes, yes. I mean, Basically, we just uh, detect uh, detect sound. Then uh, within within the range of uh, this uh, follower, within the awareness range of the group, there will only be one node elected to record the sound. Because we think uh, within certain range, one 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 record one recorder is enough. I see. So if actually the two birds are far apart, but they still can hear uh, can hear each other, you still actually would uh, take one node to record both, or you would actually possibly want to use two nodes. Uh, it really depends on the distance of the bird. If the bird are singing so loud that uh, they are detected by just the same group of nodes, only one will will start its recording task. So the main purpose of using EIP runtime here is try to uh, reduce the data redundancy. Try to only use one node uh, to, to record the data. So this is the uh, uh, indoor experiment we did with EnviroMic. Uh, in this experiment, we used uh, MyCASI modes uh, in the, on the test bed, as you'll see on the, on the top figure. Uh, basically, this target, it will, uh, it will uh, go through the field straightly and, uh, and read the title of our paper. Then, it sound will be picked up by uh, one node at a time uh, during runtime, like this. So the, the red node is actually the one elected to record the sound. So at one time, only one node is recording the, the, the sound. Also, the top uh, blue node actually is, is, is used as a baseline. Basically, the user will ho also hold a node in his hand. This node will continuously record, as, record uh, the, the sound of the target. As, as the baseline to compare with, as a ground choose. So later on, we can collect, collect the data from, from the sensor field and the concatenate them. Then we got the, 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 the sound wave of the target. As we can see, the two waves are pretty similar. Next, uh, we move to an outdoor experiment. What we did is we deployed uh, 36 uh, MyCASI modes in a forest near UIUC campus. That is the satellite picture we get uh, we, we, we put the uh, location of nodes on the map to, to show you clearly how they are deployed in the forest near road. Uh, this is the data, this is the recorded data for, for different time, and the, this is the recorded data for different space. Basically, we can see here, uh, we are seeing a lot of recorded data uh, on the left part of the figure because this is near the road, there are a lot of uh, traffic going on. And then uh, this part, we also see a lot of data. First, we are really worried about the experiment. We are thinking might, maybe, maybe there's something wrong with the experiment. Otherwise, how can we pick up sound inside of the forest? Later on, we check with the manager of the forest. We, f we found out that actually there's another group of students who is who's doing experiments in the forest the same day as we, as we did. So these are actually there. You can see clearly they are walking chases in the forest, which is picked up by our system. So that's about the storage service I developed and how we apply this storage service to build a, a monitoring application to record bird vocalization. Uh, however, in the figures I showed, uh, we actually uh, didn't uh, record any bird vocalization data because it was in the winter and it seems all the birds are actually still in Texas or Florida and having their winter vacations. Uh, next, I will talk about our effort in debugging facilities. So why we need debugging facilities to reduce development costs? Uh, we had a lot of uh, hands-on experience with real systems. We found that actually programming is not the hardest, hardest uh, part of uh, application development, development. What is even more difficult is debugging, because uh, Sense networks actually lies in the intersection of a lot of different systems. Like they are, they have, they are actually a multi-threaded execution, which is much harder than single-thread execution because we, because we have to handle race conditions and synchronizations, and also they are embedded systems which has very little runtime visibility. They like the most we used only has three LEDs to print F. Imagine that. How can we debug such a system? And also they are distributed systems. That means. There are a lot of uh, delays, unbounded delays between our communication, and the, the, the node may fail, the remote servers may fail. We have to uh, find out whether it's the problem of the node failures or whether the problem of the systems. 
And another, another difficulty comes from the uh, input of sensor networks. The inputs to sensor networks are actually the cha dynamically changing environments. They are not uh, repeatable. That means the system's behavior is unpredictable, and it's really hard for us to troubleshoot in such a system. Then we decided to uh, do something in the debugging part to, 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 more, uh, to reduce the development cost to more. What should we start with? We think uh, the, first, the first thing we should do before we can debug a system is to, to make the bugs repeat themselves. So that's why we developed a log a service called Envirolog. Envirolog can actually capture and replay the environmental inputs. How can we do that? Uh, one observation we have with our event-driven OS like TinyOS is that the sensory data actually are transferred from model to from modules to modules uh, through the function calls and their parameters. So what we can do is we can just log the function calls and their parameters and their original time sequences. And later on, we just replace them in the original time sequence they are issued so that as if the environmental inputs are the same as before. Like here, uh, we show, I show the log modules and the tested modules. In this system, we want to uh, provide a repeatable input for the tested modules, our programmers can easily uh, insert some simple annotations to their program. Then our preprocessor will automatically integrate Envirolog into their application code. Then during the, run, during the record stage, uh, the input will go through the modules to modules until it reaches the output. At the same time, the output of the log modules will be recorded by Envirolog into the local flash. Then later on, uh, during the replay stage, we can disconnect the output of log modules from other modules so that the input actually will not affect our system output, will not affect the test modules. Instead, the data are coming from uh, local, local flash by Envirolog and get fed into the test modules so that we can provide repeatable input for the test modules. How good is Envirolog in terms of replay accuracy? Let's look at the uh, results we, we get uh, from Visionet. Uh, here, basically, we used Envirolog in Visionet to record the output of the three sensor drivers, including magnetic sensor, uh, acoustic sensor, and PR sensor. Then we replay, replay the output of sensory drivers to see what's the final output of the system. The left figure actually shows uh, the trajectory of a person uh, during recording, and the right figure shows the trajectory of the person during replay. Uh, th in this experiment, we deployed uh, 37 Micah Z modes in a parking lot near UVA campus. Uh, we, we, we let the person walk through the, uh, uh, the, the parking, parking lot. Uh, we can see that these two figures are pretty similar, which tells us actually Envirolog can uh, replay the environmental inputs accurately. So what did Envirolog actually help Vigenet? First, it can help to see like, uh, how our system, how our internal variable change during runtime. Basically, Envirolog allows you to log the value of variables into Flash and, uh, and collect them later. This bottom figure actually shows the voltage we collected at each mode before and after the experiment using Envirolog. And also, uh, Envirolog can be used to see how a parameter can actually affect the performance of the system using uh, Using repeatable input, basically we record the trajectory of a, we record uh, no not trajectory we record the sensory input of uh, of a vehicle, then we replay it again, but with the, with with another value for the same parameter. The top figure actually shows uh, the final system output when we set a different value for this parameter, and the bottom figure shows the internal system metrics that are how how they are changing when we set uh, different parameter values. So this can actually help us to tune an array of parameters without physically uh, produce the physical uh, objects. Like before, without uh, Envirolog, we have to maybe drive the car 100 times to be able to, the, to do the experiment. But now, we just like drive the car 10 times, record the, all the uh, sensory input. Then we replay the recorded, uh, recorded data so that we can tune an array of parameters without uh, physically generating the target. Also, another thing uh, Envirolog helped with VideoNet is actually it can, uh, it can, uh, it can uh, simulate the target so that as if the target is running faster than before. So we can actually replay the uh, recorded data in a, in a faster velocity so that as if the target is running much faster than before. In this experiment, we did 
because we are doing it in a parking lot, this uh, vehicle can only drive at maybe, maybe 5 or 10 miles per hour. However, uh, with the help of Envirolog, we can actually accelerate the vehicle to make it run at six times of its original speed. Uh, originally, it's five miles. Now we can simulate uh, 80 miles per hour to see how the system performs for targets that are moving really fast. Actually, the, uh, the achieved uh, repeatability of environmental inputs uh, provided by Envirolog can allow us to do more things. Uh, like, we can try to debug a system. Uh, you usually, in, uh, when we debug VisualNet, uh, if we drive a car through the field, if the system doesn't work, we, we, we will say just like, uh, let's drive the car again. But actually, this, this, this time, when the car drives through the field again, it's a different sensory signature. Uh, we may not see the bug again. However, with the help of Envirolog, we can replace the exact uh, sensory signature of the car and uh, to see whether, the system, uh, whether we can uh, change the code of the system to make the system work in, in the second time. Also, it can be used uh, to compare different implementations of the same, of, of the, uh, of the same algorithm. Also, uh, we can use it to, uh, to statistically evaluate the performance of our system without physically generating the, the target. And also, this uh, recorded data can be fed into simulators to make simulators more realistic. What's your question? Is time synchronization a part of EnviroLog, or is that not assumed to be present? Uh, yes, we actually used the time synchronization from uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, what we did is we first uh, synchronized the whole system before uh, when we uh, send out the recording command. Then during runtime, the time synchronization algorithm will be stopped. They no longer try to synchronize the system because we don't want to interfere with the real application. Also, during rep before replay, we will synchronize the system again. Then make sure they can replay the. Uh, replay the recorded data simultaneously. Another, uh, another tool we developed in terms of debugging is called a sensor network troubleshooting suite. Uh, in this uh, sensor network troubleshooting suite, we try to apply machine learning techniques to automate failure diagnosis. What we did is uh, we first uh, collect a lot of data, uh, a lot of uh, different system metrics, including like a pet packet traces uh, that can be uh, collected by non-intrusive non uh, eavesdropping. And also, we can collect the execution traces using Envirolog. And also, we, we can collect some environmental measurements, use, use additional sensors. Then, in the back end, we will uh, get all the collected data, run uh, machine learning algorithm to find out what are the subset of the metrics that are highly correlated with the system failures. So uh, I will give you a simple case study on EIP runtime. Basically, what we did is we uh, collected uh, packet traces using overhearing by deploying extra debugging modes in, in, in the field. Then uh, we, we get all the packet traces back, and uh, we uh, derived a lot of system metrics, like uh, the, the count of uh, different type of messages and, and the time difference between different messages. And uh, then we mark all the metrics as good as, as good during good period or during ba bad period. Bad means uh, the period that we failed in maintaining this unique representation. Then uh, using this uh, matrix and uh, also the, the marks, uh, we can actually uh, use uh, machine learning techniques uh, algorithms uh, to generate rules for failure cases and for, for success fa fa phases. Uh, here we used a machine, machine uh, learning algorithm called PART, which basically generates rules uh, incrementally for a certain case, here are the rules generated by part. This M2 M2L actually means the number of messages sent from members to leaders, and uh, the time difference actually means the time difference between uh, an older a heartbeat from from the current leader and a heartbeat from the previous leader, and uh, this distance actually means the ge geometric distance between last leader and the current leaders. These metrics are actually only a subset of all the metrics we collected. However, this algorithm actually tells us that uh, when, if the group only contained one, one leader and no members, our system will fail. That means uh, this group is only a singleton group. We don't have anybody else to hand off the leadership. And also, it tells us if there's not enough sensory, sensory coverage, then our system will fail. Uh, based on this, uh, Rules derived uh, derived by uh, this part algorithm, we are actually uh, 
we, we can actually understand that our algorithm failed because of not enough sensory signature. Then how to, how to improve the algorithm? Uh, basically, the, the developer can go back and think about it. And uh, we found that uh, less 100% sensory coverage means a lot of node desert. Uh, one, one way to better overcome node desert is to increase the timeout of followers so that they will not forget about the object before the target move out of the desert. So what we did is we just uh, try to use a larger follower timeout. By tuning this parameter, we actually eliminated 47% uh, 47 of the failures. So those are my initial efforts on debugging tools. Basically, uh, I think we are just at the starting, starting point. Uh, there's still a long way to go to completely solve the problems in debugging support. In conclusion, uh, I developed a I uh, uh, developed a programming framework for Sentinel networks called Invarsuite. It supports try to reduce uh, Sentinel network development overhead for multiple aspects, including we have a high-level programming abstraction to hide tedious details, and we have a lot of uh, middleware services to isolate programmers uh, from those low-level details in distributed storage and multi-hop communication. And we also have uh, debugging tools that can help to reduce infield uh, debugging and troubleshooting costs. The whole framework is actually extensively uh, tested using real hardware and real uh, deployment. Then, uh, what's next? Moore's law tells us we will soon see the proliferation of uh, myriads of low-cost and miniaturized devices being deployed everywhere throughout the world, and they can be globally connected. Actually, such globally connected sense networks uh, give us more challenges. From the aspect of programming, we have to operate on more heterogeneous hardware and software. We have to operate on those dummy uh, sensor nodes like RFIDs. We also have to work on those uh, very smart uh, devices like smartphones or PDAs. And also it has to operate on uh, heterogeneous softwares. It may run, uh, the device may run TinyOS or Palm OS or Windows CE. So how can we program across uh, heterogeneous hardware and software? That's a big challenge. And also we have to program across uh, different autonomous domains across the world. And uh, this uh, programming actually is operating on an extreme scale because currently, according to statistics, we already have uh, 1 billion internet users in the world. We, can, we will expect that each of such internet users may have 10 or 100 embedded devices with them in the future. Then that means we actually operate at a scale of 10 billion or 100 billions of uh, users. How to program at such an extreme scale, that's really a big challenge. And also we have to uh, support very diverse application domains, uh, including those healthcare applications uh, in smart homes, or those inventory management in, in, in supermarkets, or uh, those uh, traffic control applications on the street, how to be able to support uh, the programming of such diverse application set. That's also a big challenge. Another major challenge comes from the maintenance side, because now we may have like 10 billions or 100 billions of devices. Then how can we make sure every one of them are still working, and how can we self-calibrate them so that they can work in any kind of environment they are deployed into? And also, like when there's failures observed in the system, how can we find the, the, the subset of the nodes that are responsible for the failures? So we really need to provide some self-calibration tools to dynamically uh, adapt the, the sensors to their deployed envi environment. And then we need to provide online validation tools to make sure that the sensors are still working after several months or several years. And also we need to automate the process of failure diagnosis so that uh, the failure point can be automatically uh, find instead of we send, send out like 10 billion administrators to manage all the, sens all the sensor devices that are deployed throughout the world. So this uh, talk is about some collaborative work uh, with my professor, Tak Abdozaher, and uh, professor John Stankovic from the University of Virginia. Actually, we are having a lot of fun with those modes and those still laptops powered by two batteries. And I also want to thank for my uh, colleagues for their contributions to different projects. This video net is a collaborative project with a lot of people. I only listed some of them. And also, I want to send my special thanks to my uh, funding providers, including UIUC, UVA, NSF, DARPA, and here, Microsoft Research. Finally, uh, I want to share some behind the scenes stories with you happened during our uh, deployment of VigilNet and EnviroMic. 
in uh, California, Florida, and, uh, and Ber Berkeley, and Baltimore, and uh, Illinois. Usually, uh, we do stay in hotel rooms, but uh, we usually do not sleep there. Instead, we prefer to sleep in the field to enjoy the open air and the wind. Unfortunately, a, lo a lot of uh, actors, I mean the most, died because of car accidents and uh, severe winter weather in our cornfield at UIUC. However, finally, most of them survived and we are able to collect like two, 200 of them on the table as shown here and we are really happy with that. That ends my talk. So please check out the related papers if you are interested. Thank you. Uh, now we have some time for more questions. Any questions? Okay. So uh, you only covered a subset of uh, the uh, work you did. Uh, on that slide, you have the, uh, the programming abstractions, the storage. You said you also had to work on the uh, mountain hub and other services that needed to support this, uh, and also the debugging you mentioned. So among those, uh, your experiences of, of, from these, uh, which you find is actually the hardest part? And if you actually were to start from scratch again, let's say, you know, at the beginning of a graduate school, which one you would focus on at the beginning, if, you know, after you have gone through this and in, in hindsight? Uh, I feel the most uh, needed tools for Sentinel was, is actually debugging support. Cause, uh, for in terms of programming, we do have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, languages and different paradigms to program Sentinel networks. However, in terms of debugging, we really uh, don't have enough support. Uh, debugging is actually really really hard. Uh, we actually like spend about two thirds of our time in debugging the system rather than design and implementing the system, because uh, debugging may. The, uh, the system may fail because of, of, of a lot of reasons. First, like you may have uh, bugs in your code, or you may have bugs in your algorithms, or you may have wrong assumptions about the environment. So that, uh, like uh, originally, you assume the environment uh, is is uh, as a parking lot, but actually, when you go to the physical environment, you find it, the environment changes actually will affect the performance of system a lot. Like. Uh, from my experience, like uh, we we usually did our experiments in in parking lot uh, at UVA. Then we uh, when we actually go out to the field to deploy the system, we never found that the system will work in the real field. We have to do a lot of things to debug the system because the environment changes a lot. Like uh, uh, when you deploy on a grass ground, the communication range will actually reduce a lot, and also the sensors may not work as expected. Like. Uh, some of our magnetic sensors actually will actually affect by the wind. If there's strong wind, we will actually we will actually uh, sense magnetic uh, sense ma ma magnetic objects because the wind will blow the antennas. Those antennas are actually uh, metals. And also, a strange thing is that like those magnetic sensors are, are, can actually be affected by the weather. Like whenever we see uh, a sunny day with with cloud, if the cloud happens to cover the cover the cover the uh, top of the sensor, then the sensor will also see magnetic readings. So for those kind of unexpected environmental uh, effects, you cannot uh, like express them when you're designing system or implement system. You can only find it when you actually deploy system. So during system deployment, since we have so little uh, runtime visibility, we really need a lot of debugging tools or failure diagnosis tools to help us to zoom into the exact bugs that cause the problem. Any other question? Yeah, this follow on this question. Uh, since you have encountered so many uh, say, uh, different environments when you're deploying the system, you said debugging, debugging is a major issue. And so has this, uh, uh, have those real, uh, real world experience actually contributed to you to, uh, to you know, have used this uh, real world experience to Come back and modify, for example, your upper level abstraction or you know, protocol design. I think if you have this, you know, use this real time experience, the real world experience, you might, you know, next time you might be save your much debugging. Uh, yes, so basically, uh, 
uh, what I found is that those uh, in-field uh, experiments actually al al always uh, give me uh, more ideas about what direction I should go. Like uh, uh, initially, I was just assigned to this uh, surveillance system project, so we worked a lot with the surveillance systems. But later on, uh, we found that uh, uh, in in other applications, actually, those are disconnected. They are operated disconnectedly, so there's a need for a storage system. And also, later on, when I has, have more experiences with those uh, real deployments, we found that debugging is really hard. And also, uh, those, uh, to, to evaluate the system is really hard because we need to physically generate the targets. That, 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 that is the motivation of my later work. So basically, every time I go to the field and have some new findings, actually it motivates my new research in, in the next step. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.